Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Dragons 2020 All Online. My name is Randy Barnell. I'm from the Gearbox Entertainment Company, and it is my pleasure to speak to you today about building Borderlands 3 narrative. 2020 has been kind of an interesting year. I had really hoped that I would be doing this in person with you in Poland. I was really looking forward to that trip. But unfortunately, a global plague has taken us out of that business. So we're going to be doing this digitally. And I'm going to be talking to you about what we do, uh, what we did in building the Borderlands 3 narrative. It's really cool. It's been almost a year. Can you believe that since we released Borderlands 3 to the world? Uh, and uh, we've, we've been working on a lot of different things. And I want to talk to you about some things that, that we've really worked out uh, as, we, as we continue to release content for Borderlands lands three and continue to think about this so really today i want to talk to you well first off you may be asking who's this randy varnell guy right um i have been in the uh, the entertainment industry and the software industry for over 25 years i worked at a company called macromedia at the start who made uh, web design web graphic pro uh, software worked for ensemble studios worked for mumbo jumbo worked at several other different companies but I've, uh, the, with Borderlands 3, it marked pretty much my 20th major uh, release of software. So I'm celebrating a big milestone. At Gearbox, uh, which I've been Gearbox for about 11 years now, I, I've done a lot of different things, producer and director. I was also creative director on a game near and dear to my heart called Battleborn. Uh, Battleborn was a really cool game that just didn't quite do everything that we wanted, but it was a really exciting project to work on, and I was thrilled to be able to, to be a creative director on that. Currently... I'm the director of creative development at Gearbox. I get to run a department that does uh, all the work on our stories, on our cinematics, on our VO recording, and really thinking about how we do better as storytellers to entertain you and captivate you with the type of games that we make. So what are we talking about today? Well, there are really three things that I want to talk about as we kind of look over the, the history of Borderlands 3, kind of a year in retrospect after release. I want to talk a little bit about some things that we did to build the story and build the team to build the story. Then I want to talk about uh, kind of as a veteran developer, as an as a old guy in the software industry, what we did to survive the release of the game. And then I want to tell you a little bit about some lessons that we've learned, a little bit of a lightweight post-mortem as we look into what we're doing to chart the future for uh, our narrative and story development for Borderlands 3. So you ready? Let's, let's jump in and let's first look at what we did to get together to build the Borderlands story. When you, when you work on a game, I hope that all of you get a chance sometime in your career to work as a part of a big collaborative team with lots of people. Hundreds of people worked on Borderlands at, at, at Gearbox and a lot of people that we really, really love working with. But when you build big collaborative games that have stories and gameplay features and lots of guns and enemies and everything that, that you do there, it's a real big trick to try to figure out how to get everybody working together. I've been at Gearbox, like I said, for a little bit over a decade now. And when I worked on Borderlands 2 and the previous Borderlands, we had a very small writing team. In fact, most of the time, we only had a single writer that wrote those immense games. One of the first things that we learned when we started to work and came to work on Borderlands 3 was a single writer can't do it all any, anymore. The games are big enough that we needed to build a team. But the team and the story are built more by more than just a single writer. They're built by an entire group of collaborators and stakeholders, people who work together that want to see their creative vision come to fruition. So we thought about the team in a couple of different uh, uh, ways that we structured. Now, this is going to be the driest part of the lecture. I'm sorry. It's, I'm going to have to put up a kind of a producer type of chart here. But I just want to talk a little bit about the, the, little, bit of the little bit of inside workings of our team and, and how we work. So there are kind of two big components. And I know this is I'll, I'll talk you through the slide for a second that we think about. One is our narrative department. And you can see that blue box on this slide that talks about the narrative department. That's now called the creative development department. It's a department that I run at Gearbox. And it includes writers, voiceover directors, people who do pre-visualization and cinematics. This is certainly kind of the people who spend all day, every day, working on being, you know, putting words on the page, recording great actors as they do our dialogue, and working through the, the, the details of making a game but a game is made by a lot more people than just the writers. 
uh, there are also the green box on the other side, there's senior creative leadership on the project. They're mission design directors and level design directors and art directors. People who are veterans of the industry who we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, our friends and our co-collaborators who work together to also contribute and bring the story to life. And then there's certainly senior creators at Gearbox, the chief creative officer, that we have a creative director on our project. All of those people, and then I, I put the little pink box down there at the bottom, special guest stars. But these people are absolutely critical. These are the individual artists and the mission designers and the level designers and the programmers and the effects artists and the cinematographers and the animators. All of those people who, who group up together to make a story come to life in a game. When we think about how we formed then the narrative process for Borderlands 3, not only did I create a team of people who were dedicated to creating that content, but we created a rhythm, we created a group that met on a regular basis that brought in all of these boxes of people together to work together on creating the game. We want to be sure that everybody has a chance to get their creative input in. We want to, be a, we want to take a look at our content and we want to see uh, all sorts of different ways that, that we might be able to improve our content, how we might be able to make it better. Did this joke land, did this joke not land? We wanted to be sure that we had everybody together to come together. I'm saying together a lot, aren't I, right? This is a little bit harder than I have an audience. But we wanted to be sure that we invited all of the developers from different disciplines to participate in our creative process for building a story. And that's a little bit of what we did there. I hope, again, that you guys get a chance to work on the big team. When you do, think about how that works. Think about who needs a say and who needs a, a, a chance to also co-create with you as you write and build your story. Uh, sometimes it's easier. I know just to think of yourself as a single writer and I'm going to be the genius that's going to that's going to write it all and bring it together. But when you're working as a team, when you're working collaboratively with other great designers and beautiful artists, it's important to listen to all of the contributions and let them in. Let them in to influence what you do and you can influence what they do and you can create something great together. Second thing I want to talk about when we looked at the content for Borderlands 3, we had not made a Borderlands game. We made the pre-sequel a few years earlier. Borderlands 2, the last big numbered title of Borderlands, released in 2012. 2012 to 2019, that's a seven-year gap between major Borderlands titles. Uh, so it had been a while. And when we came back to the game, we sat down and actually intentionally thought uh, in our story and content development about what we needed to put in the game. We certainly, as creators, every time you sit down, you want to do something big and new and creative, and you want to bring everything fresh and new to the game. But it's really important, especially when you're working on a sequel, when you're working on a follow-up to a big, loved game, that you really diligently think about the type of content that you have. It's really important, for example, like this slide says, that we thought about a mix of familiar. What are the characters people love? What are the settings and the places? This is the this is Claptrap, one of our one of our, um, our really our mascot character for the franchise. And behind him, you can see a, a picture of Pandora, the the desert kind of Mad Max planet that you find yourselves on the Borderlands franchise. And we wanted to be sure that we start the game in a place that met players' expectations, both of the characters that show back up and the place. But then we want to take you to something different. When you really are following up with a story, when you're writing a sequel, when you're writing a second and a third and a fourth installment in the franchise, you really have to think very carefully about how much familiar you add and then how much new that you bring to the story. Of course, every time we write a Borderlands game, we love our, our central characters. We call them vault hunters. And the story, uh, those are the, the player characters, the stories that you, the, the characters that you, the player controls, as you adventure through this wide universe of, of on the borderlands. And in that, we wanted to be sure that they were new. They look different. All these characters, Amos, Zane, Flack, and Amara, they have different backgrounds. They have different paths. They have different personalities, different, uh, different play styles, different features. And we wanted to look at all the ways that we brought new to you. But we also added other characters to the story, some other, uh, some new faces to your 
NPCs that you deal with. We added uh, more planets. Uh, we actually go to over three different planets and borderlands through major planets and a lot of different sub moons and satellites. So the adventure is bigger. You're going more places, you're seeing more things, but that's an exercise that you have to sit down and plot out and pace out. And we did from the various, uh, very early chances. When you work on your sequel, when you follow up, spend a little bit of time thinking about how you mix familiar and new together to create a great player experience. All right, so let's move on from that, from talking about the mechanics of building a story. I've, I've talked about this in some other places and you can find some, some, some me uh, going on about online about uh, some other things that we did in building and structuring the, the story. But I really wanted to talk about kind of a past, present, a future approach of what we did. That was building the story was something that we did in 2018, 2019 as we worked toward the release of Borderlands 3. Now that it's out, we're kind of in the present. We released the game. So I want to I have a real talk with you a second as a developer. And I want to talk about something that, that we don't talk a lot about in our industry. And that's how do you survive this major moment that is the release of a video game? Most of you who have worked on, on video games before have spent years of your life. You spent your passion. You really worked hard at bringing this artistic vision of this great experience to the, to the world. And there's so much joy and so much thrill in that experience. It's, it's why we get in the industry, isn't it? It's why we want to do this thing that we do. It's why we stay up late nights and work weekends and, and sacrifice so much to make these great visions and dreams come to life on the page. And you do that and you work for months and you work for years and you work with teams and you fight and you struggle and you bleed and you cry and you laugh and all of those things come together. And finally, and if you're lucky and you're diligent and you're good, your, your game releases to the world. And that is a different experience. So your game goes out and you, you, you hold your breath and you wait. How is it going to do? How many people are going to purchase it? Are people going to like it? And, and you learn that moment that we all learn as developers, that moment of like, oh, no, my baby finally is going to be reviewed and rated by everybody around the world. And that is an intimidating and daunting prospect for us. When we create... Whenever we create, whatever it is that you do, uh, and it, whether you are a writer or an artist or a musician or a coder or a technical artist or a, 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 you're working in the gaming business or marketing or PR or, one of, or, or animation or, or concept art, whatever it is that you do in the development of the game, every time that you create and you contribute to a game, you're kind of putting right, a little piece of yourself into your creation. We can't help but to do that. That's where the passion, that's where the fire comes from. But as artists, when you put a piece of yourself in it and you share the world, it's often very intimidating because we feel that we are sharing ourselves with the world. When people love us, then it's great. We're on a mountaintop. No feeling is better than to sharing a part, sharing a part of yourself and having it loved by, by people uh, that, that get to experience it. But when people don't like it, uh, when the reviews come out, when people tell you about things that, that are, are not up to their expectations, they didn't come out the way they wanted, that can be really hard. So I want to share with you kind of three different tricks from, from uh, someone who's done this a few times to you on how to survive the release of a video game. The first important is probably the most important. Like I said, these are big passion projects for us. And what's the first thing that you need to do when you release your game? I mean, there's so much that goes in and I understand that like releasing a game, it never ends. You finish it, you, 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 you wrap your game up, you do the final compile, the, the, it passes QA, you put it to certification, it passes certification, then you get ready, you have a release party, the marketing PR goes on and, and, and talks and you get ready and all the energy and all of the passion and all the emotion is bundled up and what do you do? What do you need to do first? Let me give you a big piece of advice here. You need to rest. You need to rest. So much of ourselves, so much of our hearts, so much of our sweat, blood, and tears go into making the game. 
that to prepare yourself for what happens at release, the first thing you need to do as soon as you can. And I, again, I'm not trivializing the amount of work. I know a lot of people have to work right up to and then through and beyond release. If you're working in a game that has a live concept, like we did with Battleborn, your, your work never ends. It's just getting started at release. And I understand that. But after a long period of development, it's really important that you and the people who work for you, if you're a manager, by the way, have a chance to rest, take a week, take two weeks, take a month, whatever your company can allow, but you need to take some time where you detach. You pull away from the creative passion project that you have and you do something different. Play a different game, read a book, listen to music, go fishing, go, go hike a mountain, go drive around your city, whatever it is you do. Spend time with your loved ones, with your, with your family, with your friends, play a board game, do something different and rest because here's an important thing to realize as we work in this industry full of passionate people. And this is a quote that I, I tell younger developers a lot. And I want, I want you to really hear this. And I want you to really hear the words. The machine will eat everything that you feed it. And then its appetite will increase. By the machine, I mean your business, your company, and not only that, but your own passions. A game project, a creative project, will continue to suck from uh, uh, energy from you. It's like a vampire. It'll bleed you dry. It'll take all of your passion, all of your energy, all your time. It'll take overtime hours. It'll take weekends. It'll take months. It'll put everything that you can put in it. It'll take all of that. And once you do that, what you're really doing is you're setting the expectation for your company, your peers, and the world that that's the level of work that you can continue to contribute. And it's often not a healthy pace. I know in our industry, we have a lot of criticism in different places about people who, who are expected to work more. And I know and I've worked in places in my past where I've been, it's been a mandate, not a, uh, in my past where it's been a mandate for us to work long hours and weekends in order to hit important deadlines. That's great. But at some point, it's up to you to stand up and say, you know, I've got to manage my life. I've got to realize that there's more to life than just this passion project that I have, that for me to be a healthy, uh, awesome creator, I need to be well-rounded. If you are one of those people who puts everything into a project, if you have a company that really wants to, to, to work right up to the end and do that, be sure when you release the game that you take a few minutes and you rest and you relax and set that as a pace. Learn to do that through your career. And trust me, if you can learn to do that early, if you can establish those boundaries early as a creator, you're going to be much happier with your life and your creations to the world are going to be that much better when you come back renewed and energized to create again. Here's the second thing I want you to think about, and this is something I, I hope that all of us do. I know as, as artists, sometimes we get really focused on the art of what we do. Is my, are my words right? Are my lines right? Have I coded? Is my code optimized and efficient? Uh, are, are all of the different things that we're putting in here state of the art? Am I operating as, as someone that is a veteran and best in the industry? And when the, when, the, when the reviews come out, when the game comes out, we judge our art and our creativity almost, almost entirely sometimes based on what people say. What do the critics say? What do the reviewers say? What do the players say? But we have to remember that while we are in and, and we love the, the industry, we love the art, we love the passion of what we do, that this is a business. We are making games uh, uh, hopefully at some point down the road to make enough money that we can make another game, that our company continues. And at a more personal note, that we can eat, that we can buy a home. Sometimes we can take a vacation when we go to rest, that we can support our families, that we can, that we can take care of ourselves and take care of our future. And so when you finish and release a game, be sure that not only are you looking at the sentiment, at what people say about your game, but also look at the sales. It's really important. One of the things I try to tell all of the, the, the younger and newer members of my team is, uh, you know, the people who say things on the internet, that's only a small, small, usually less than 1%. Uh, the loud, angry voices that you hear or the loud, excited, happy voices that you hear. 
are, are usually less than 1% of the total amount of people who will consume and purchase your game. So be sure that this game come out, look at how it's doing in the market, as well as how it's doing and what people say online and social media and on forums and on Reddit and all of those other places like that. Be sure that you balance those things. Or in other words, love your art, but don't neglect the business. Don't, don't forget to look at the fact that this is a business. And both of those, uh, both the comments and the, the business can tell you how your game is doing. Sometimes very important to have that healthy perspective. We can all think of games in, in our industry that have been on the extremes of that, right? Games that have been received very well, have, have, have rated in the high 90s on Metacritic, but have sold very poorly. And some of those game companies who did those great passion, passion projects didn't survive to do another game because their business didn't follow through. There was something about the game while it was a critical darling and we all loved it. We all loved the, the story and the message and the art. It didn't appeal to enough people to let the business continue. That's an important thing to think about. We can also think of those games right now. I think of a couple of big ones that are industry right now that people love to hate. Uh, those games, if you look at them on, on uh, Metacritic or on Steam reviews or other places like that, sometimes are rated down in the 40s and 50s. People just love to hate these games. But they sell tens and hundreds of millions of copies. Lots of people playing them. They're very big business successes. Sometimes it's really important to realize the truth that the market, uh, the market and the sentiment don't always agree. We love it when they do. They don't. So it's very responsible for you to consider both sales and sentiment when you look at your game and evaluating how you did when you survive release. Now, here's the last and hardest point on, on this particular area that I want to talk about to you today. So one of the things we always tell, uh, we tell new developers um, and young developers is don't read the comments. When your game comes out, people start posting the, the YouTube, YouTube uh, reviews. They start talking about it on your Reddit forum. Uh, the reviewers post reviews on all their places, and, and then they have comments below that. Don't read the comments. Because as we all know, on the Internet, we're all anonymous. No one knows who we are. We can go and anonymously post anything that we want anywhere without any kind of repercussions or damage done. That entices people to be honest. And sometimes to be, let's, let's face it, to be unkind with their criticism. Um, even when there's truth in the unkindness, the way people say things can be very hurtful. Like I said earlier, we, we put passion into these games and put a piece of ourselves in there and share that. And that little piece of heart, that little piece of passion and self can get crushed and crumpled up uh, in the comments really quickly. So don't read the comments. But here's the problem. We all do. We all, let's all admit it. Let's, let's take a moment of self-honesty here as video game developers and let's, let's admit that as much as we'd like to, to, to put up the shields and say that, no, I never read the comments and never look at that, it's really hard in this social media fuel world not to eventually hear some bit of sentiment that people say. Most of us, uh, or, or even more than that, we read all of the YouTube comments, we troll Reddit, we watch it for weeks at a time from the moment that the game goes live and watching now streamers who are, are consuming the content live, trying to analyze every facial expression and every tick that happens and every, every little thing that they say, are they laughing, they're enjoying it, what are the people who are watching them playing saying, it's, it's a big loop, we all do it, we all jump in there. So what happens when we read the comments, what happens when that hurt starts to creep in and, and we read that? Like, I'm hoping that all of you have, the, have only the most pleasant experiences there and everything that you read online about your game is positive and thrilling and, and awesome. And those are amazing to read. We have a lot of amazing fans from Borderlands who have been with us since we first released Borderlands 1 in 2009. And we've met them in conventions. We read their comments online. They follow us on Twitter and talk with us. We love those fans and we love those people. We love to hear all that, but there are more than those people around. Uh, in in border, the case of Borderlands 3 and specifically the case of Borderlands 3 story, there were a lot of different opinions on the Borderlands 3 story. Here are a couple of quotes that I pulled just last week and uh, looking at, at a very positive one and very, very negative one. And we looked at some different quotes. There are people who have had and in this case, this is, this is kind of the truth of what you'll find about your own games on the internet. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. People are different. They like and hate different things. But how do you parse that? 
what do you do with that? You know, some developers say, well, everybody's disagreeing, so we're great and we're right and we did everything good and, and we're just going to continue doing what we're doing. And that's certainly one way to do it. But I think if you are going to be one of those people who read the comments, who look at it, who think about what you're doing, I'm going to encourage, uh, 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 if you're going to go there, by the way, I, I still hold, hold true to the fact that you should read as few comments as possible. Just continue to let your, your business and marketing people and your company tell you how the game's doing. And again, you know, uh, people vote with their money. If it's selling well, you can, you can, you can usually be, uh, be happy with a job well done. But if you do read the comments, if you do want to engage with the people who are consuming and enjoying or not enjoying your entertainment, let me give you a piece of advice that I like to share with, with uh, other developers. It comes from one of my favorite writers, a guy named Neil Gaiman, uh, who is a veteran. He's done master classes on, on creating narrative and writing. And uh, if you search around the internet, I'm not going to share all of them today. You can find a, a, an article or summary by him called Neil Gaiman's Eight Rules of Writing. And what I want to share to you today is one of, uh, one of my favorite pieces of wisdom from this. It's actually rule number five. And here's what the rule says. When people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. But when they tell you exactly what they think is wrong and how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. So how do you parse that? That's a very complex statement. How do we, how do we think about that? What does it really mean? Well, it kind of goes like this. We put out entertainment for the world. And we as developers often want to make a lot of excuses. Well, they just didn't understand. We were under so much time constraint. We did it all at the last minute, and we didn't have the budget that we wanted to, and, and we had some creative differences in the process. People don't see that part of the process, nor should they be expected to. There's a lot of things that goes on development that you and I know and we share, and there's stories and their constraints, and there are things that affect our art, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, once we release a product, the product is, product is out, and the people who enjoy and experience our entertainment only get to see it based on what we share with them. And so they're going to have a reaction to that. When those people comment on things that they don't like, on things that they don't uh, think that work for them, on, on things that are offensive, on things that are, are just not fun, if you read those comments, you need to understand that from their experience, they're right. There's an old, old phrase that you don't hear a lot more anymore. The customer's always right because in the age of social media, we like to debate about everything. But to a degree, when you read the comments and you hear the heart of what people are saying, there's almost always a, a, a golden nugget of truth in there about something that you can do to be a better entertainer in the future. If you're going to read the comments, you need to pay attention to that. You need to do it with shields up and not take it personally. That's a very, very important part. Understand that there's a criticism of the content, not of you as a person, and you need to understand that. But here's the other part of that. While we can't expect people to understand our journey, our constraints, our budget, our time, our staff, all of those things that go into making our content come true, those are realities of what we do. They don't know what your goals were. They don't know what you were trying to accomplish. They don't know how the final content got edited to be something different than what you creatively envisioned in the first place. A game is a, is a collaborative endeavor. Lots of people touch the content before it goes out, and usually it makes it better. Sometimes it doesn't. But people don't know that. So when people start coming at you with very specific fixes, Oh, well, you needed to add this moment here, and this character needed to say this and do this, and you should have cut this and add that. Those are things that, that you are the expert on. And while you should listen to the problems and honestly accept and assess the problems that come at you, it's up to you to make the solutions and make the corrections in the future. Listen to the input, but realize that you are the trained expert. You're the person that did that. Sure, sometimes there are users out there who are even better experts in, in certain parts of the field that you can. When I, have, uh, when I have people who have written and published other narrative games and other books and all that, that that criticize and talk about what we do, man, I really perk my ears up and listen because I want to get better. I want to grow and I want to grow as an artist and be sure that my, my next creation is even better and even stronger than the one I just put out. 
But at the end of the day, it's up to me to take those lessons and apply them to my work. And it's up to you to do that. So take this lesson in heart from Neil Gaiman, not from Randy Varnell, from Neil Gaiman, and, uh, and use that. If you read the comments, do so responsibly. Don't internalize it and make it personal. And be sure that you understand that there's usually always a nugget of truth in there, but it's up to you at the end of the day to figure out what that nugget of truth means under your constraints and your creative process and under the vision that you and your team have for creating your entertainment. All right, let's transition now to the last part of my talk. I want to talk about kind of what are those lessons? What are those nugget of truths that, are, that our creative development department at Gearbox and our broader creative team have done? Every time you release a game and after you go through the review and release process and everything's come out, all the emotions have gone everywhere, we get to sit back and do exactly what I was talking about. We get to think. We get to refl reflect. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water here real quick. You get to think, you get to reflect, and you get to consider what it is you're going to do for the next game that you make. What are you going to improve? What are you going to change? What are you going to keep? What worked fine? And it's really important to have it. We sometimes call them postmortems in the industry after death. Uh, I sometimes postpartums <laughs> after, you know, after birth. You know, we, 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 uh, we are dealing with the, the shipping of our child out to the world. Uh, it's really, there's no post to it. It's a continuing process for an artist, and we're always doing this. Sometimes we do it in the middle of a project, but it definitely after release, sit back and think, here are some things that we, we learned. And this really comes down to two or three uh, big lessons for us. One of the first things that we learned about Borderlands 3 is this word here, focus. After seven years between Borderlands 2 and Borderlands 3, when we came back to it, it was, it, we had a lot of emotion. There was a lot that we wanted to put in the game. We were very excited to come back to the game and the universe. And of course, as every developer, we always want a sequel to be bigger and better and more exciting than, than the previous games. In doing that, we want to put everything in. We want to pour all that passion in. We want to put all of those characters in. We want to put all of that time in it. We want to go to new places. We want to put in more things. And certainly, Borderlands, you see all of that. You see more characters. You see more story. You see more worlds. You see more guns. You see more enemies. You see more gameplay. You see more features. Hours and hours and hours and hours. In regards to the main story, though, this is where we got into a little bit of a problem. We had a lot of characters. In fact, the screenshot that I've kind of got up here, if you can see the slide and what's going on here, is a, a quick screen of, of really what we consider kind of the, the, uh, the main tier principal cast for Borderlands 3. That's a big cast. That's like a, a big heist movie is what it feels like. And, and it seems... There's one, there's one bit of logic that we tell ourselves at the beginning of a project that that seems appropriate for a game that you're going to play for dozens, if not hundreds of hours, that you want that. But one of the things that we heard in our review and critique and criticism of Borderlands is that there, there was just not enough time and not enough development with some characters. Some characters fell flat because people didn't have, didn't feel that their arc was satisfying, that the character didn't grow during the game and all of that. The game narrative overall, I think, works well, but, but we didn't focus. We, in that desire to give our fans everything they imagine. And by the way, there are a lot of characters that, that are not on this, that are previous Borderlands characters that we also heard about. And we knew we would hear about it. Uh, characters that didn't show up and as the main cast of Borderlands 3. And even some of these characters, Tiny Teen is a great example, uh, kind of took a, took a backseat to some of the other story stuff that, that went on here. Um, those are hard choices to make. And we, even with making those hard choices, we didn't focus as much as we probably should have. So one of the things that we're gonna be looking at in the future with Borderlands is on the main mission story, how do we focus that story around a smaller group of characters and be sure that we tell an emotionally satisfying story with those characters. I think that's really a really important lesson for us to all learn, that bigger is not always better. And I say this as a guy who is, is coming to you from Dallas, Texas right now, where, where bigger is all, almost always thought about better. But its focus is a really important thing. It doesn't mean necessarily one character, but maybe not 30. So it's going to be a lesson that you're going to see. You've already seen it. If you've been playing our DLCs, some of our great things, uh, uh, 
uh, the the casino DLC, um, the 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 newest one we just put out, Bounty of Blood. Uh, we put out uh, several story DLCs to follow up with Borderlands, and all of those are already learning on some of these lessons. Smaller cast of principal characters. Still, still a lot of characters in the game, but a smaller cast of principal characters. Focused story, focused goals, and something that you can ingest with a, a little bit uh, and appreciate with a, maybe some fewer words uh, that you have to listen to as well. Here's a second thing that we really heard from our reviews and our fans in that. As we conducted the poop train, I love this, 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 this image here because one of the, the coolest narrative bits that we've ever done in Borderlands, I think, was, it was came out around the time of Borderlands 2. It was this video. It's a meat bicycle for two. You can find and watch this on uh, YouTube. And it was when we were introducing this character here, Krieg the Psycho. And it was a really about a three-minute little, little story about how Krieg meets Maya and how, about how this crazy psycho has to deal with the inner turbulence of having a crazy mind and a sane mind, and they're fighting, trying to get the words out. It's a really cool thing. But uh, he has this line, and they're like, I'm the conductor of the poop train. Well, how does that relate to Borderlands 3? Is, this is a little bit of a stretch, you know, but... Um, one of the things that we heard is that we had a lot of what, what in the narrative circles we call scatological humor. And that's a big fancy word to say. We had a lot of poop jokes. Um, poop humor, uh, base humor, slapstick comedy, when you're writing humor, does work. But it is often very divisive on your audience. Some people love it. I'm a dad. I tell a lot of dad jokes. I love it. Those, those types of things but it doesn't work for everyone. And when you use that type of humor in your game, you really need to look at the broader audience and think about it. Now, we actually did go back and we started hearing from people, man, you use the word turd a lot and you say poop a lot. We looked at, it, we went back and looked at our script and we looked at the game and we like, did we, did we really? We thought that we had actually diminished that amount from, from previous Borderlands. And what we found was while, while we actually make those jokes fewer than we have before in some cases, um, there was a perfect storm of poop that all happened at the same time at about the two or three hour mark in the game. And it wasn't just the main mission writing and script. It wasn't one writer, even the writing team that was responsible was the entire development team. There were some missions that focused in on, on uh, 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 porta potties as a, as a topic. There were some uh, main plot stuff that happened on that said the word turd a lot. There were just some emergent, uh, some enemies that you fight that occasionally could talk about uh, 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 poop and poop jokes and base humor and that. And it all kind of landed at the same spot. And for a lot of people, that was too much. So it's an important thing to hear for us that we've got to be careful on how we pace that humor. Uh, we, in the future, we're going to be looking about that. There's, see, there's, a, and there's also not only in the, in the pacing, the amount of that joke, but one of the things we want to tune up with our humor. By the way, humor is really hard. And you all know this if you've ever tried to tell a joke to a group of friends. Some friend is going to be laughing their ass off. Some friend is going to be like, I don't get it. And some friend is going to be like, oh, you're making another dad joke. Great. Everybody receives humor differently. And while we try to be sure that in Borderlands that has a reputation for humor, that we diversify that and we find different types of humor, man, it's hard to land those jokes. And some people love the joke. Some people hate the joke. It's just a part of life. And so some of that we have to just kind of deal with and contend with as we continue to keep the identity that's made the franchise popular. But we hope in the future to kind of smarten our humor a little bit. We love dark humor. We love legitimate humor. And we're going to need to look at our pacing and, and are already doing that in our DLCs and our future projects. We want to find a way to keep Borderlands irreverent in our sense of humor, but maybe a little bit less immature. We're never going to lose all of it, but we hope that we can find uh, a little bit better so that maybe the people who were really turned off by that don't feel so, uh, so find the content so off-putting all at once. So stay tuned. Something we're looking about, it's an important lesson that we've learned and are looking at and are hoping to, uh, to, to improve as we, we work through the world of Borderlands. The third thing that I want to talk about is this, and this, was a, this is a really uh, interesting lesson for us as creators, and it says this, empower players to consume what they want. There's an inherent 
conflict sometimes between an artist and between a consumer, right? We want to share our art with the world and we want to share our vision to people. And in that, there's a little bit of ego that every artist has that says, you need to hear our art and view our art exactly as we want you to see it. And let me just put this out that maybe, maybe on a video game, especially a long open world video game like Borderlands, where people are encouraged to explore and try out different new things, you really look at how players consume your content. Specifically for us, this came in Borderlands 3 with the cinematics. Now, cinematics are kind of a double-edged sword. If you want to be sure that your story is clear and people understand what is going on, you can certainly drop a three-minute cinematic right somewhere, and hopefully it's entertaining and draws people in. But it absolutely, and we've studied this. We have a user research team at Gearbox that look at the impact and the ability to understand what's going on with the story. And they told us, man, when we add the cinematics in, the ability for players to understand and comprehend the story that was going on uh, skyrockets through the roof. But comprehension is different than enjoyment. And what you need to be careful about is how much medicine you require. We, we say this phrase, yeah, it's a take your medicine moment. It's when you, uh, you, you have to convey details of your story, details of your narrative to players so that they can understand your story. But too much medicine is a bad thing. In Borderlands 3, uh, when we shipped the game, we did not allow players to skip our cinematics. And while for some players they were cool the first time, when you're going back and playing the game the second time, a lot of our players play, play Borderlands the story through three, four, or five times. When they go back subsequent times, that's just a three- or four-minute time period that they are pulled out of active gameplay, and we take that away from them. We patched that after release, by the way. All, all the cinematic can be bypassed, and you can move on. You can play at your own pace. But in the future, we want to look at a couple of things. One is we're going to be sure that we handle cinematics a little bit better, probably fewer. Um, we'll, we'll see about that. It's a really, it's a really hard balance between uh, understanding and entertainment. But we definitely want to be sure that when a player comes to those moments of content, whether it's a cinematic or an NPC that's giving you important mission details, that we make those as efficient as possible and we allow the players to continue at their own pace as often as we can. Removing that friction uh, from players as they consume your content, as they entertain, is going to be really, really important and something that we're going to be looking at in the future. All right, we did it. We got through a presentation of Building Borderlands Narrative for Digital Dragons 2020. And I just want to give you a couple of statements in conclusion. One, if you are a player for Borderlands, a Borderlands franchise and Borderlands 3, thank you. You're awesome. We love you. Uh, you are what make us want to keep doing what we do. We want to make more Borderlands. We want to make more crazy worlds. We've, we continue to release DLCs for this game as people continue to buy it. And we thank you so much for being a fan and being a consumer and enjoying us. Also, I thank you for your feedback. It does help us make these games better for you and better for more people. We are listening and we are correctly thinking through and parsing what that is. If you haven't played Borderlands 3, check it out. I think there's some really great gameplay in there. I think the story's good. I think you're going to find some cool things, and hopefully, even if you're checking check it out on a professional courtesy level, you from Digital Dragons 2020, take a look and take a look at it after you've heard me talk through this and see if you agree or disagree with my, my, uh, my thoughts on this. I'd love to hear from you and all that. But we're very proud of it. Borderlands 3 is a game that I play even after I make it. It's a game that I love. I think it's amazing, and I hope that you, you find that too. But even if you're not a Borderlands fan, we love you too. We're all developers. We're all creators. We're all artists. We all share this wonderful experience of taking our passions, bringing to market, and share it with the world. I hope you, as you move forward in, whether you create narrative or art or code or animation, whatever it is that you do in your work, whether you're a software tester, whether you're a CEO of a company, whether you're on the marketing or PR team, that you will keep creating. This year has been hard for a lot of us, and I'm not going to add all the cliche phrases and unprecedented times and, and, and all of that. But we are learning. Uh, we are learning new ways of entertaining people. We're working remotely. We're working distantly. But our art 
can bring us together. You as creators, let me encourage you, keep sharing, keep making, keep getting better in what you do as you work just like Gearbox and just like me to entertain the world. I hope that the rest of your 2020 is better and better and better each and every day. And I thank you for joining us for Digital Dragons and hope to see you again. Thanks very much. This is Randy Barnell from Gearbox Entertainment Company. And it's been my pleasure to talk to you today about the Borderlands 3 narrative. See you later.